Good morning, everyone. Please bow your heads forward for a word of prayer. Dear most kind and heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us through another week. Thank you for keeping us all in good health that we can come today and worship with you. I pray, Lord, that you will bless the proceedings of Sabbath school and that the adventurers will do a good job and that everybody will be blessed. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our first song is number 388, 388, Don't Forget the Sabbath. Two, three. Don't forget 
that the Sabbath, the Lord our God, hath blessed of all the weak, the brightest of all the weak, the best. It brings repose from labor. It sounds of joy divine. It beams of light descending with heavy beauty shine. Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day. Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day. Keep the Sabbath holy and worship him today. Who said to his disciples, I am the living way. And if we meekly follow our Savior here below, he'll give us of the fountain who streams eternal flow. Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day. Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day. Day of sacred pleasure, its golden hours will spend in thankful hymns to Jesus, the children's dearest friend. O oh, gentle, loving Savior, how good and kind thou art! How precious is thy promise to dwell in every heart! Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day. Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day. Our next song is I Am a Sea. I Am a Sea. Two, three. I am a sea. I am a sea. I am a C-H-R-I-S-D-A-N And I have C-H-R-I-S-D in my H-E-A-R-T And I will L-I-E-V-E-T-E-E-L-L-Y I am a C I am a C-H I am a C-H-R-I-S-D-I-A-N And I have C-H-R-I-S-D in my H-E-A-R-T And I will L-I-V-E-E-T-E-R-N-A-L-L-Y our next song is Jesus Love is a Bubbling Over. Jesus Love is a Bubbling Over. Two, three. Jesus Love is a Bubbling Over. Jesus Love is a Bubbling Over. Jesus Love is a Bubbling Over. Hallelujah. Love is a Bubbling Over. Love is a Bubbling Over. Love is a bubbling over, hallelujah. Bubbling over, bubbling over, bubbling over, over. 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus love is a bubbling over. Jesus love is a bubbling over. Jesus love is a bubbling over. Hallelujah. Our last song is He's Able. He's Able. Two, three. He's able, he's able. No, oh, he's able. I know my Lord to carry me through. He's able, he's able, I know my Lord 
though he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He healed the brokenhearted and set the captive free. He made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He healed the broken hearted and set the captive free. He made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. Okay, let's have Ryan. Ten of consideration. Five nine zero. Trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds over. Will we do his good will? He abides with us still. And we all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no more pray. To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but a smile quickly dries it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sign nor a tear. The by what we trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but a toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but it's blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he says we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey. <coughs> For 
there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Happy Sabbath, let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the Sabbath. I help the adventures to do good today. I help them to obey in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we just had the welcome by Caden. Sorry, yeah, Caden Corbin from the Spike Song Adventure Club. I'm not sure what went wrong with the volume, but thank you, Caden, for your welcome. Uh, my scripture reading will be taken from Job chapter verse. 22 and Job chapter 13, verse 15. In spite of everyone, everything, Job did not sin or accuse God of doing wrong. God may kill me, but Still, I will trust him. Amen. 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 Okay, at this time, we're going to have the pledge by Jatani, and we want all adventurers, wherever you are, to stand for the pledge, the law, and the adventurer song. But first, we're going to have the pledge by Jatani. All right. Sorry. Because Jesus loves me, I always do my best. Amen. Because I hear what they say. All right, let's sing our adventure song. We are adventurers at home at school at play. We are adventurers. We're learning every day to be honest, kind, and true, to be like Jesus through and through. We are adventurers. We are adventurers at home at school at play. We are adventurers. We're learning every day to be honest, kind, and true, to be like Jesus through and through. We are adventurers.
Amen. What would you do if one day your friend came to you and said, your house just burned down? And then a few minutes later, somebody just broke into your car. And then a few moments later, more bad news. I don't know about you, but I would be upset. I may even do or say things that do not align with a godly character. But what would you say if I told you that this actually happened to someone? Yes, and his name is Job. Job was a rich man who lived in the land of Uz. He feared God and shunned evil. One day, the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them. God tells Satan, there is no one more faithful on earth than Job. Satan challenges God to prove this and to do so actively without actively protect, protecting him. Let's listen as our adventurers tell us this story. Of Job. There was a rich man named Job who lived in the land of us. He was a good man. He always put God first in his life. One day when God was talking to his angels, Satan dropped in. God asked Satan, have you ever seen such a good man as my servant Job? Satan liked to argue with God and said, anyone can be good once he has everything a man can want. He has a home, family, cattle, and great wealth. Besides all of that, you don't let anything harm him. He doesn't have a clue what it is like to be miserable. God was convinced nothing could stop Job from loving and honoring him. So Satan asked God, Hey, let me prove to you that Job is will be a big cry baby and start saying bad things about you the minute something goes wrong. God replied, okay, but I know Job is faithful and that you can't turn him against me. Do what you want, but don't hurt him. So Satan rubbed his hands and said, yes, I'm going to get Job. Job lost everything but his wife and his life. He went from rich to poor in just a few hours. Did Job get angry with God? No, he fell down on his face and said to God, With nothing I came into the world, and with nothing I shall leave it. The Lord gave, and now the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. With all that went wrong, Job didn't blame God or stop loving or trusting God. God called to Satan, See, you cannot make Job hate me. There is no man more perfect than Job. Satan said, Trust me, if you let me hurt him so that he's in pain, 
people start calling you bad words. But I really didn't want Satan to hurt Joe. So he said, go ahead and make him uncomfortable. But don't kill him. Satan zapped Joe with huge swords from his head to his feet. He was miserable, but he still wouldn't blame God or say anything mean about God. Job's wife tried to convince him that he should curse God and die, but Job just could not do that. He loved God. Then three of his best friends came to cheer him, Elijah, Bildad, and Zephar. They weren't much help. They all thought Job had done something terrible and God was punishing him. In those days, if anything went wrong in your life, people thought you had done something bad, which angered God. But John knew he hadn't done anything wrong and that God wasn't angry with him. Elijah took a say, Face it, Job. You did something mighty wrong and God is getting even with you. Bildad encouraged him, saying, Come on, tell us what you did. Then ask God to forgive you or you might as well die. Zophar added, Job, you did wrong and upset God. Get the message? Job was beginning to wonder why God had allowed this to happen. Then a younger man named Elihu said, Maybe God isn't angry with Job. Maybe there is another lesson to be learned. Job should not be too hasty to think God left him. Then God spoke to Job directly. Can you begin to know of my greatness? Can you instruct me? Job got the message. He didn't need to know why things had happened. He just needed to keep trusting God and God's love for him. God then gave Job health, double the wealth, and a long, happy life. The lesson is to always trust God. Amen. Brothers, sorry. Brothers, sisters, friends, do you sometimes feel like Job? alone, forsaken, forgotten? Job's story is about trusting God, even in our suffering. When we suffer, we do not need to know why we suffer. So we need to trust in the one who is in charge. He knows why we suffer, but more importantly, he can care for us, help us in our troubles, and ultimately reward us with eternal life in a land where no one suffers. Faith does not need to know all the ways. It is enough to know that God is in charge and wise enough to handle it properly. Do not doubt, just obey in faith. Just obey the Bible. Jesus' own word. Okay, everyone, this time we're going to go into our classes for our lesson study. Screen when you need to make an input. At this time, I want, I want to invite our Pastor Peters to pray for us as we commence our study. Pastor Peters, can you pray for us, please? Yes, let's pray. Thank you. Our loving God and Father, we thank you for the privilege this morning to go into your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit open before us the beauty of your kingdom. Teach us more about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And bless us with a wonderful discussion. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Beautiful. Thank you. 
Let us commence our study, our study for the week. And bear in mind, we have limited time. So we want to have good dispatch as we study together. If we go smoothly, we can be able to at least gain much knowledge. Our study for this week deals with creation, Genesis as foundation part one, which suggests next week we will do part two. So let us um, commence by using our memory verse. I think our memory verse is an essential one. Can any person care to repeat our memory verse? Can any person care to repeat our memory verse, which is taken from John 1, 1 to 4? Go smoothly, please. Any person care to repeat our memory verse? In the beginning, In the beginning was the word. Beautiful. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was a light of men. It is quite beautiful to note that this verse is uh, made a springboard for our study this week, which has a lot to do with Jesus being an integral part of creation. In our open section, it mentioned that the gospel, or say in Genesis, brings to our attention about five different facets of the gospel. Talks about origin of sin, origin of sin, plan of salvation, and even gives us the old idea of the flood that's in Genesis itself. And then it even talks about, it gives us the, the whole concept of what, or much of what the Bible gives us through all the various books. And we believe that Genesis in itself gives, you know, builds the foundation because we often repeat even Genesis 3.15. But let's look at um, in the beginning. When we think about the phrase or the statement, in the beginning, what is that actually conveying to us, um, class members? What, what is that, that statement conveying to us in the beginning? Well, what, what can we learn from that simple phrase, in the beginning? And this is where Genesis starts. In the beginning, God. Well, what, what, what can we learn from that phrase? Well, it never happened before. It never happened before. So the beginning of time. Beautiful, Sister Wendy. Anything else? Any of the other members? It's a person that it never happened before. Any other thoughts? Okay, go right ahead and raise your hand. Go ahead. Press on hand raise it's brother, brother Carl. To me, it's saying that God was before time, that he started everything. God started, and I love the, the, the way, Brother Carl, thank you. God started everything. It was not started by Darwin. It was not started by his philosophy. God started everything. I and mean, we can clearly say we exist because God created. Isn't that beautiful? We exist because God created. But any other thoughts that we can get from that simple, simple thought? We, in the beginning, maybe we can, I can also bring to our attention that the mere fact that that phrase starts or commences the Bible, it tells and it continues through thoughts about the origin of sin, you know, God dealing with mankind, the plan of redemption. It tells us we have not come here by chance. Neither will we end by what man can do. We will end, we start with God, and we will end with God. And I, I think that in itself conveys the thought that we are not here by chance. If we were here by chance, for instance, if, if we if we try to carry Darwin's philosophy to, to its real conclusion, if we here, if we were here by chance, what would be the outcome of mankind? So let, let, let's just try to, um, if we were here by chance, what do you think would be the outcome of mankind? Or would mankind have an outcome? How could we be here if we didn't have love? Pardon? 
Uh, I did have a submission. Now, I wish we can turn on our camera so you can see who, who is speaking, if possible. I beg your indulgence. Can you go ahead again, please? Okay, we, we want to want to continue. We are told in our, this fourth session, we also were created by God at an absolute point of time. And this really supports the whole idea of mankind, even in a natural way. When a person is conceived, the person was, the conception begun at a certain time. And also the delivery came at a certain time. So even in a natural sense, mankind had a natural beginning. So God in himself begun creation in a, in a, in a, in a way that we can go right back and say that we had the earth had a beginning and by God's grace, it will also come to this system, this earth we live in will also come to an end. And one thing that really grasped our attention, what part does Jesus has to play in this whole plan or in this concept of creation? Or did Jesus play any part in this concept of creation, this whole plan of creation? Did Jesus, what, what part did he play? What part did Jesus play? Let me think about in what Genesis, in what John chapter one, verse one and four, what part did Jesus play? Or has he played any part at all? Has Jesus played any part? Let, let, let's, let's give our input. Jesus was the creator of heaven and earth. He was the creator. So Jesus was the creator. So he had a part to play in the whole plan or whole, uh, whole, whole, whole um, what can we say? Well, the system of creation, it wasn't just, it was a part of Godhead. Jesus was probably Godhead who played, or beautiful, and appeal any other person. Okay, um, I would say that as we look, we saw that Jesus was in eternity past. Beautiful, beautiful. And he is going to be in eternity future. Mm -hmm. And his role is to guide us or lead us from eternity past to eternity future. So he is the way, the conduit by which we can move from eternity past to eternity future. Beautiful, beautiful, Ella. And maybe that's why the term, Brother Gilford, go ahead. Yes, uh, I just want to read something here from the Desire of Ages, page 20. And it says that in the beginning, God was revealed in all the works of creation. It was Christ that spread the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. It was his hand that hung the worlds in space and fashioned the flowers of the field. His strength set it fast the mountains, set it fast the mountains. The sea is his and he made it, Psalm 65, 6 and 95, 5. It was he that filled the earth with beauty and the air with song. And upon all things in earth and air and sky, he wrote the message of the Father's love. So Christ played a very important part in the creation. He is playing a very important part right now in the redemption. And he's going to play a very important part in restoring man. So without Christ, as the word of God says, everything that we have that is made would have not been made. Okay, beautiful. And I think that really brings it home well. So we can make a conclusion from that first section that Jesus himself being involved in creation has the integral part to play even at the conclusion of this whole system. That's why we need to keep our attention you know, placed on, on Jesus in this whole plan. But with that in mind, it seems as though that there are many philosophies in terms of the, the, the length of 
period that God took to create this earth. I'm sure from our from our reading, maybe what we've heard, people try to advocate the idea that creation time was a long period. For instance, you know, when we talk about the evening and the morning, people believe the first day will span over a long period of time, not just 24 literal days. But from our study, what, what is our what is our basic Conclusion, what, what can we conclude when God said the evening and the morning were the first day? How, how do we see a day as opposed to what people want to teach that creation span over a long period? But what, what was our, what, how, can we, how can we really understand and appreciate that when the Bible talks about evening and morning, it was a, a day, not a period of time as some people try to advocate. Brother Gifford? Yes, for me, I usually go to the story in Exodus chapter 16, where it talks about God dealing with the children of Israel in the wilderness in supplying food for them. For example, we know God said that he would rain manna for six days, and on the sixth day, you must collect a double portion of manna so that that manna could be used on the seventh day because God had already instructed the children of Israel to rest on the seventh day. Now, if you look at this as a vast period of time, as mm. some may claim, how long would you say as a human being now that you think if you could wait a thousand years, you don't even live a thousand years or four years before you eat something because the portion that was doubled on the six days was to supply your need on the seventh day so for me when i hear a person talks about that that whole scenario with god reigning manner dispels any myth about a vast period of time it says to me that it was literal because me as an individual i eat food every day thank you thank you brother word hello word even your mic is off hello word your mic is off hello word even before we get there thank we you. can see we can see the, the movement of the sun and we know that um when god created we said the the evening and the morning um, was the first day. And that designated the, the, the time period, a 24-hour um, period. The, the dark side following, um, followed by the bright side and a 24-hour period there and, and that whole, whole scenario. So even the movement of the sun can be a demonstration can say to us that it was a literal 24 hour day. So I, I think we have sufficient appreciation of a literal day in our dispensation to, to, to really make a firm conclusion that the creation we did span over a period of, a long period of time. Because the cycle, as we find, continues when God created in the first week. The cycle continued in the second week and the third week. The cycle continued because you will have to make a, 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 a quite interesting conclusion that a Sabbath will have to span over a long period. So you just can't try, we need not to try to, to put something in a picture just to confirm so, something else. So we, we want to appreciate that this day from the picture has, has a, 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 a literal period as opposed to just um, conjecturing up to a long period of time. I saw a world hand rain. I'm to try, try oh. to make a point, excuse me, maybe may, may big indulgence, try to make a, make a point as crisp as possible. Let's we call, remember we have a, a limited time. So make your point as crisp so we can move on uh, smoothly. Well, my, I, I hand, the, my hand is also up when Elder Warrell is finished. The okay. other thing that we can look at is when God actually, God himself wrote with his finger um, the fourth commandment 
he himself wrote this down. So therefore, he written it, um, and it was designated as the, 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 the seventh day, the fourth commandment, that adds credence to the thought that it was a literal 24-hour day. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Yeah, in relation to what Brother Wall, Elder Warren just said, that's what I was about to say, the implication. If we say that it's, it's the thousand years and the, and the long expanse of time mm -hmm. that each day is, it affects the theology of the Sabbath, which is what the devil is trying to do to get men away okay. from yes, the Sabbath right. of God. Mm -hmm. I, I think we, we, we could really conclude this aspect that, that the enemy has tried over the years to create certain philosophies to take God out of the picture. We, the, people don't want to ascribe God for doing things. So as much as if you can take God out of the picture, then we don't have nothing to give a cult to. So I think this may be the philosophy behind trying to create this kind of forum, trying to create this kind of philosophies so that God will don't, we don't need to, to give a cult to God for anything. First, let me look at the Sabbath. The blessed part of, of, of Jews or the Sabbath. When it talks about um, Jesus himself, the Sabbath and creation. What we have found, maybe in this current situation, this is need to, need to be very cognizant of this. It seems that the Sabbath will have a great attack even today. For instance, I have found that they are closed. They have closed stores down over the period of time. They are gradually opening stores, but they are still trying to suggest that shop should remain closed on Sundays. They're gradually opening places, but they're trying to make it seem as though, look, we can still try to maintain closing various stores on Sundays. I wonder how do we see this kind of, this kind of trend of thought? Well, what does it have to do with the Sabbath? Or what bear will this have upon the Sabbath as we go through this dispensation? Do we see this as a maybe a precursor for something greater? Or how do we see that? I saw Barbara. Go ahead, Sister Barbara. Turn on your mic, please. Turn on your mic, please, Sister Barbara. Turn on your mic, please. It's still off. It's still off. It is still off, Sister Barbara. It isn't working. Right, this is going. leading up to the Sunday law. Can't hear me? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear so you. So what I'm saying that this is um, getting in place for the Pope and the Sunday law. This is what it's leading up to. Okay. And, and we want to see this whole concept of the Sabbath and creation as an integral part of our salvific experience. If we start taking away the Sabbath, we are subtracting God, we're taking away God from what he has done for the benefit of mankind. For instance, what has Mark 2.27 tells us? What does Mark 2.27 tell us? Any person here? What does Mark 2.27 tell us? Mark 2.27. That Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. For the Sabbath. Uh, we, we, have heard, we have heard a statement over the past in so many forums. We have heard a statement in so many um, areas. What is Jesus actually saying? The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Okay, can we give it our, our, our input here? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Any person cares to give their input here? Taken from in, on Mark 2.27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Fine, so I, I'm sure if you go into the store and buy a trousers, that trousers wasn't made for you. That was made for anybody. Made for any person. If we, if we bring that out to its conclusion, the Sabbath was made specifically for the benefits of man. So if it's made for you, you just can't ignore it. If I may 
a dress or trousers for you. It was made based on your size, your, your, your outlook. I have measured you well, so therefore it's made specifically for you. And we can use this in the Sabbath was made specifically for mankind, not for the Jews. It was made for mankind. And Jesus was stressing this point. It was made for mankind, therefore, throughout man's dispensation, the Sabbath will always have a relevance. I see Brother Henry. Huh? Yes, and just like the trousers that you speak about, if you don't buy it and take it home and use it, it can yeah. be of no benefit for you. So even mm. though the Sabbath is created for man, if we don't obey it and use it according to God's requirements, it will become no benefit for us. So we must take it and use it, and then it will benefit us. Okay, brother. Well, I think that, that we, we can conclude to that it was a sign between God and his people. It was a covenant sign. And therefore, well, Gilford just said, if you don't use it, it will be of no benefit. But even if you don't use it, it is still there. It is yeah. something that cannot be, be erased. It cannot be, 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 be you know, gotten rid of. It is there as that covenant sign between God and his people. Okay, beautiful. I, I just, I still want to wish that those who, it's if I'm Dave Jove, said, we just want to wish that those who want to make a submission, if you don't, if I can't see you, raise your hand, I can't indulge, I can't engage you. So please, if you care to make a submission, I just want to reiterate, you could indicate by making sure you, because one of the things we need to appreciate what God did on the Sabbath. He tells us he rested, he blessed, and he sanctified. Isn't this beautiful? Oh, yeah. He rest, he blessed, and he sanctified. Has he done this to any other day of the week? No. Has he blessed the first day? The second day? Has he sanctified the, the fourth day? Has he, has, um, so uh, this in itself, convey to us the, the nature of the Sabbath, what God has done. And maybe we can, in our natural sense, you don't tell in an early person certain special things. There's some people that you reserve certain things for. And God has reserved this when it comes to the Sabbath. For instance, there are two things, there are a few things we need to bear in mind. Creation, the fall, and the cross. Mm -hmm. Creation, the fall, and the cross. It is quite interesting to see in Genesis all of these, these three concepts came out. What part of Genesis speaks to us of the fall? What part of Genesis speaks to us of the cross? Can we recall any part in Genesis that really speaks to us of the fall? Or even the cross. I know we know about creation. Any area in Genesis speaks to us of the of the fall of a cross. Can you recall any part in, in Genesis? I think I think Genesis three fifteen um, speaks to to that. Okay, where, I will put where, where we yeah, saw the, the fall. And we saw that there would be a redeemer. We okay. saw the, the, the participants in, in the scenario, um, Satan causing the fall. But we saw that there would be someone who would come and crush the head of, of that serpent and also restore mankind, give mankind a chance to redeem. So Genesis 3.15 speaks of that. Uh, and, and thank you, Ella. One of the things we, we really wish to appreciate that when God in his wisdom and his mercy, the Bible tells us in the early day of creation, he said everything was good. And it came down to the, to the latter part when he made man the last part of creation. He does but things were very good. Very good. But it's amazing that things have changed 
between then and now. When we look on this earth, we can't say everything is very good. We still see a tinge, a tinge of, of sin and a tinge of, 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 of decadence and, and degrading situation. But, but we want to really praise God that things would turn around again. Amen? Um, as the verse said, you call it a tinge? <laughs> you call it a tinge? No, it's a thing. I thought you said a tinge of, um, of decadence. Oh, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's stronger. <laughs> A song and a tinge. <laughs> okay, yes, yes, yes. I think it's right. We can use a stronger word than that. A song and a, that, 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 that tinge. Even when you when you look at well, I I guess we'll get to marriage. But when you think of of marriage, how what marriage has descended um, into? Let me say descended into man with man. I mean, that is not a tinge. That is a real a real. Um, Magnitude, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and maybe uh, uh, forgive me for um, almost making it so simple. It's more than a tinge. But you, you went you went back to the whole idea of marriage, and we are often taught within the church's um, you know, teaching that there are things that have remained or were brought about during creation, and they're still evident today. We talk about the Sabbath. And we also mentioned marriage. And it is quite amazing that both of these institutions have been bombarded over the past by the enemy, both of them. The Sabbath have been questioned, it have tried to be erased, people have trampled on it, people ignore it. And also the marriage is one of the institutions that have been established from creation that even to, to this dispensation, it is still being not, not necessarily abandoned, but people are just abusing it to the extent of even ignoring it. And I wonder why these two, these two institutions have taken so much lashing over the past. I see um, Brother Guilford, go ahead. Yes, um, they are known as the twin institution. Twin institutions. Right. And marriage is under attack because God created us in his image and the devil wants to destroy that image. The character of God was that creation. So if the devil can destroy the character of God, which he is using the Sabbath and the marriage, he knows that he would have gotten God's creation, God's character to suffer damage. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. And I, I think that these, these are some important, welcome Brother Limbro. Right, these are some important facets to really deal with. Not, not only deal with, but to really fully grasp that God wants to maintain in his creative universe, these kind of, well, we may say that when we enter new heaven, there wouldn't be any marriages given in marriage, but there would be the Sabbath. But in entering these two institutions really speaks volumes about God. It speaks volume of God, that God is interested in mankind. He wants to make sure that these institutions reflect his character reflect his glory. And this, these are things we need to, to keep in mind. But I wanted to bring it home as we, as we deal with um, creation and the fall. We started with Jesus being part of creation. And we also went on to Jesus. And we looked at, Jesus not only had an integral part to play in creation, but he, will, he has an integral part to play in redemption. What other part that Jesus has to play in the whole plan for mankind? He had it in creation. He had a redemption. What other part does Jesus has to play when it comes to us as human beings? Does he have another part to play or, it, or his whole mission is over now? What other part does he have to play as, as we see it, as we go through life? 
I saw Sandra. Um, in so his the part he has to play is in preparing a place for us to heaven. I okay, preparing a place for us to heaven. To heaven to prepare a place for us. Okay, beautiful. He has gone to prepare a place for us. I'm sure we, we, we want to use this, this uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. I think these two texts really gives us the idea. He not only played an essential part in creating the world and creating mankind, he didn't only play a part of, part of dying on the cross of Calvary for, for our sins, but we are told in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Any person cares to have it? I will read it on here. Therefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And I think we, we often remember Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The oh. wages of sin is what? Death. Death. The gift of God is eternal life. This is where Jesus, or here again, where Jesus comes in so forcefully in, in the whole plan. He not only did that for us in creating us and dying for us, but he also promised us everlasting life. Isn't this beautiful? Mm -hmm. He has promised us everlasting life. Yes, your hand. Yes. Okay, the person have their hands raised. I just want to acknowledge every person's hand. Some person had a submission. One one simple fact that I would like us to, to take away. You're talking about, about Jesus and his role. And we should when we look at the, the narrative story, we found that there was the fall because man wanted to be God. Remember the serpent told Eve, and if she ate, she would be like God. No and, God and, and this is what she deserved. Now for us, she refused to put God in his rightful place. She wanted to, to take the place of God, so she ate. In our instance, no. We should not want to take the place of God. And therefore, if we are not going to do this, we must have Jesus, the God, enthroned in our hearts. We must have Jesus to be our God. We must have Jesus to be the person who is leading us. And it's not a forceful thing. Remember, he says that he stands at the door and not. And if we... Um, and vitamin, he will come in. Will come in. So therefore, we have got to be that humble to allow him to come and take over our lives. Many times, we fall and we fail because we do not want to do this, but we want to do what we want to do. We want to make ourselves gods of our lives. Mm -hmm. okay. Unmute your mic, Ella Vincent. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we, we, we constantly want to, 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 to bear, as the world said, that Lucifer lose his position because he wanted to elevate himself above God. We dare don't want to, we want to always see Christ as the, not only important in our life, but the supreme being in our life. We, 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 we have to give a cult to him for what he has done. And I, this is what we need to constantly um, bear in mind. Is he says a word? Says a word, are you saying something? Okay. <laughs> so we, we, we constantly want to bear this in mind. So we, we have a few more minutes um, um, coming up. So we want to, to bring it home in, in somewhat. Above everything that we can deduce from our study today, we want to appreciate that the 
creation has the beginning mm -hmm. and this, uh, this creation has an end. We need to conclude what Jesus himself said that, that he's long suffering towards us. He said that someday that this heaven and earth shall pass away. He reminds us that this creation has grown under the nature of sin today. But we have the, 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 the general hope that he shall recreate this earth. And where he tells us that some of the things that we have experienced now, the kind of, the kind of um, greed and, and sin in a whole, this will be no more. And it's all because... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your, your audio is gone again, Ella. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Right, just so, but the host, the host just has something to play with that. Yeah. Okay. So we, we, we want to we want to have a understanding. So I want to give you the, any person a last word. Any person who have the last word? Brother word? Brother word? Oh, it's, mute, brother it's, not, it's not a word, it's not a word, it's a question. I don't okay. know if you can look at it, but the, the last question, and um and in our lesson study, as believers stand faithful to the word of God, how can we minister to those who are struggling with questions of sexual identity? Why must we not cast stones even when the people who like the woman caught in adultery are guilty of sin? So how can we, as a practical thing now, help people who are struggling with well, I think one of the things we need to constantly keep in mind and the word that a person in Christ or no person in Christ is condemned, or if you are in Christ, there's no condemnation. I think as individuals, we often want to condemn people who are practicing lifestyle outside of ours, whether same-sex marriage, they're practicing outside of ours. So we, we, we need not to condemn them. Yes, I think there are practices which the Bible is in support, but we need to give them the, uh, the understanding that when a person is in Christ, that these things can be overcome. So we need, point, we need to point people to the solution to much of our problems, our mankind problems, is because they're outside of Christ. When a person become and be drawn to Christ, a lot of things that dominate mankind will be dropped off. If these are not, if you're not in Christ, these things will dominate your life. Whether it's greed, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's pride, whether it's envy, will always dominate our life. So we cannot try to put certain things in certain brackets and believe that they deserve a greater condemnation. With everything outside of Christ, they are condemnation. So I think what we, we are pointing people then to Christ as much as possible. Amen. Amen. I think it helps us to really deal with, and I don't, I think we're going to go through life with these kind of vices. These are vices that are affecting mankind, not only in this dispensation, they have affected mankind eons of years now. But Christ still dealt with persons on the basis of having an interest in them, and he is not going to condemn them. So we, we're, not, we're not here to condemn anyone. We're just here to point people to the solution which is only in Christ. Amen. Absolutely. Any person has another word? Any other? I just want to give um, our audience the final word. I don't want to take the final word. Alapita, you have a, a word? Brother Roger, you have a, a special word? I just want to give any person to have a, a word. Mm -hmm. The Walden family. In closing, Ella. Yes, thank you. I, I want to say that we have seen that creation, God was at, Jesus was at creation. He was there for the fall. He was there to redeem us. And he's there now even interceding on our behalf. Oh, yes. That is all because of his love towards us. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. John 3.16 tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
So everlasting life is available to all of us. Okay, thank you, beautiful. So that is, and this gives us the joy of what this life has to offer. We're not just here and to live and die and the cycle continues for mankind. I think Christ came to give us life and to give us more abundantly. And not only abundant life in this present world, but he came to give us everlasting life. Life that, that will not last for two weeks or two years or a hundred years. Life that will last throughout eternity. And, and this, I, I think is why the Bible describes Jesus as Alpha and Omega. Begun the work and he will end the work or end the work in terms of this dispensation. But he will continue throughout eternity for all of us. And I think this is what we need to really be appreciative of what God has done. So we, 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 we want to, to, to bring the close. I, I haven't seen the host said anything. I know last week they give us a, a time limit. Yeah, you're, of, you're, you're all the time. Okay, right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Adventures, are you ready? Yes, we are. Okay, I think up next we have some special music. Happy Sabbath, everybody. The song we are going to be li singing is Lifted High.
even if the devil. Once there was an old man who always praised the Lord, but he had a mean neighbor filled with Satan's horde. Oh, he hated that Christian, wanted to turn him blue. So he thought and wondered exactly what he should do. He heard that Christian say, Oh God, I have no more bread. If you don't provide soon, I may wind up very dead. The wicked neighbor grinned as he formed his evil plan. He, in a window, he threw bread. Then also quickly he ran. The loaf hit the Christian right on his bald head. He thanked God for providing and hearing what he said. Then boasted that neighbor, it was I who had you fed. Your God did not help you as his face turned very red. Oh Lord, said the Christian, yet I must praise you still. For, for I know that you provided even if Satan did your will. Okay, up next we have a slideshow presentation from our adventures of all the activities they have done um, during this year. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the special music um, by Sister Abigail and come back to the presentation. The song that I will be singing is Trust in You by Lauren Daigle. Letting go of every single dream I lay each one down at your feet Every moment of my wandering Never changes what you see I try to win this war, I confess My hands are weary I need your rest Mighty warrior, king of the fight No matter what I face, you're by my side Tomorrow brings There's not a day I had you have not seen So in all things be my life and breath I want what you want, Lord 
burning nothing less Pray you don't move the mountains I need you to move Pray you don't part the waters I wish I could walk through Pray you don't give the answers As I cry out to you I will trust, I will trust I will trust in you Thank you. I got it this time.
let's all bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear most kind and heavenly Father, thank you for the way the lesson study went this morning. I pray, Lord, that somebody was blessed by the proceedings. And I pray, Lord, that you will be with us and dwell with us throughout the rest of the service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today in worship. And remember to always trust God. Amen. All right, so we're going to go straight into our divine worship service. The church family at Merlin the Quarter, Spike Stone and Black Bess, along with friends far and near have met for worship. Let us come together in anticipation of the blessing God will pour out for us. It is only the Lord's mercies that have kept us from complete destruction. His compassion never ends. Let us therefore enter this act of worship with thanksgiving in our hearts and praise on our lips. Oh, that men everywhere would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. He satisfies our mouths with good <laughs> things and renews our strength like the eagles. Let us thank, be thankful and bless his name for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Let us pray. Gracious Father and loving God, we assemble today in response to your invitation to meet with you for worship. 
We give you our thanks for all your mercies and blessings of the past week. We thank you for each other. We are grateful for the opportunity to fellowship by this medium, even in these second and of separation. We invite the Holy Spirit then to be our teacher and enabler as we worship. May he, through his power, encourage our hearts, lift our spirits, and bless each worshiper according to our individual needs. May the Holy Spirit sanctify that which we offer today in song, in prayer, in testimony, and in the reading and proclamation of your word. May he help us to worship in spirit and in truth. And in the end, may we be blessed in such a way that we will give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. All these things we ask in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. This is the day that the Lord has blessed. Rejoice, be glad in it. Good morning, friends. We are indeed thankful to God for allowing us to be here another Sabbath. We are here to mark not only another moment of life, but to recognize what an honor it is to join together to give God glory, honor, and praise for his love, mercy, and grace given to us as families and also as a body of believers. Today, on behalf of our pastor, Peters, elders, and members of the Northwestern District, I am extending a joyful welcome to every virtual member and friend from England, Canada, the USA, parts of the Caribbean, and right here at home in beautiful Barbados. These flowers are for you. I don't know if you can see them. In our local virtual congregation, I want to welcome the Honorable Colin Jordan, Minister of Labor and Social Partnership, but more important, our Member of Parliament for the Parish of St. Peter. We welcome you, sir, and your family. On behalf of pastors and elders, let me extend an appreciative welcome to all the families who make up the Northwestern District. Give me a wave. I will now share my head of lettuce with you. Let us love one another sincerely. Let us welcome strangers and visitors cheerfully. Let us be generous with our blessings from God. Let us be faithful to duty for the love of God. Let us today be reverent as we worship our creator God while waiting to receive the abundant experience through the spoken word. Once again, I say welcome.
The scripture reading is taken from John chapter 1, verses 1 and 12 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Here ends the scripture reading. Let's, let's bow our hands for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we, thy children in this district, want to praise, honor, and glorify the, your name. You continue to be a great and awesome God who is careful to look after your children. Many times we disappoint you. We upset your plans for us. But in spite of all our failings, you rearrange situations for our benefit. Lord, that is deep and abiding love. And we say praise God for your love. Today, along with our thanks, we also humbly ask for our forgiveness. We all have sinned. We have omitted duties you required of us. At times, maybe even misrepresented your name, dealt harshly with a brother or sister, confused our children by our actions. Lord, please forgive our sins. Wash them away in your blood and put them in the bottom of the sea. For your forgiveness, we bow before the crucified Savior in gratitude. At present, we in Barbados are beginning to see the light at the end of the COVID-19 tunnel. We thank you for the foresight and wisdom of our Prime Minister, members of Parliament, the Tsar, Chief Medical Officer, and the other health officials. We also thank you for the guidance and wisdom for our President, conference committee, pastors, elders, and other church leaders who are taking us step by step through this unknown, so far safely. Lord, we give thanks that we have allowed ourselves to be used by you for the safety of us all. Lord, we lift our hands and hearts in praise and wonder for your guidance to your children. Friendly Lord, we ask that you bless the children in our congregation. Draw the ones that have strayed with the cause of love. Help us as adults with our varying problems, whether they be social, financial, or physical. Help us, Lord, for we cannot help ourselves. We thank you, praise you for your love, kindness, and care for us today, in the past, and for the coming week. Be with the speaker today. And may our hearts be blessed and warm by your words through to us through him. And finally, Lord, keep us, for we cannot keep ourselves. Save us, for we cannot save ourselves. Bless us and keep us. And we look forward to spending the ceaseless ages of eternity with thee in heaven and on this new earth. For Christ's sake, amen. Amen. At this time, we will now have an item of special music by Sister Siobhan Roach. Praise the Lord and happy Sabbath this morning. I pray that as I sing this song, that it will be a blessing unto your heart.
Sabbath. For the next few minutes, we are going to be speaking with some of our former members who now live in the United States of America and Canada. These members are Raven Campbell, my brother, Sister Evadne, husbands, a former member of our church, Brother Sherwin Johnson, and Brother Nigel Griffith. Sorry, Brother Nigel Worrell. The first person I want to speak with is Brother Raven Campbell. Good morning, Raven. Good, good morning, Limbrook. Um, good morning to Mom first we want to... and all those in my hearing. Okay, first we want to ask you, how are you coping? How is your family coping? How is the church in Florida coping? Well, the churches are doing the same thing that you are, that we all are doing now. We're using technology, we're using the internet to have our services. 
as of yesterday, the president um, dictated that he wanted um, all people to go back to church by tomorrow. And I don't know if that's going to happen because as you see, I'm sure you see CNN, you hear CNN, and you know that the numbers are constantly rising. And I'm, I'm sure by probably Tuesday, we will have a million deaths in the United States. And it is not an easy thing to go through because for those who are working, you can't go to work. Um, for me, who um, travel still for my work. I can't go anywhere. I've been home. The only places I go is home to the supermarket and back. And that's been now for the last seven weeks. So it's not an easy thing. I go out on evenings um, and do a five mile walk just to keep my sanity. But that's about all that we can do. And we can just continue to pray and stay with God and stay with family and make sure that we are all together. And one of the things I would like to part with, um, you know, there were some people who may have been riding high and they've lost their jobs. But remember, um, we had the prodigal son and when the prodigal son came back, his father took him in. And I hope as a church family that we are doing the same thing. There might be some church members who are out there who may have left the fold, but remember they are still our brothers and sisters. So we should take care of those brothers and sisters. And then what I would like to leave with you is that um, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, 4, you have love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, love does not boast, and love is not conceited. So because you may be riding high today and doing well, remember tomorrow you could be in the same boat as the guy to your right or to your left. So be patient, continue to take care of each other. And for the young people, um, it is nice to know that you are home and because of technology, you are the kings and queens today. But please help the older ones through this period. We will get through it as a family and continue to stay steadfast with God. Thank you. Thank you, Raven. Um, that was very encouraging and um, we really want to thank you for that. The next person we are going to speak with is Sister Evadne Husband. Is Sister Husband available? Okay, if Sister Husbands is not yeah. there, then um, she's, is here. Rather... she's here. She's there. Okay. Good morning, Sister Husbands. Good morning and happy Sabbath to you. Well, happy Sabbath to you as well. No, you can't imagine how happy we are just to hear your voice. It's been a long time since we heard you. And That's so we are, happy. we are happy this morning to know that you can join us. We, we know that New York is in um, somewhat of a crisis at this moment. And so that even makes us even happier to know that you are happy, healthy, and safe. Now, we want you to tell us how you are coping in all of this. Well, I'm not living in New York anymore. I do live in New Jersey. Okay, that's a hot spot. Um, you wouldn't know unless somebody told you. <laughs> but um, I don't go out of the house, as they say, to stay in. Because to me, those, you know, we had quite a number of deaths. And those, those who have been touched with the virus and they have got better. But it sounded like those who had other illnesses before, 
they, um, it affected them, the virus affected them more. So I know that I, I'm a diabetic okay. and they have other, the other illness that you get when you're getting young like me. <laughs> and so I don't go outside. I stay indoors. Okay. But, um, not what long we... ago, I was at my Sabbath school. I go to church. It's a small church, small in number. We didn't always have a church. We used to rent, but now we have our own church. So I just had Sabbath school there and come here to greet you. And I'm glad that I'm able to hear you and I can also see you. <laughs> so welcome to each and every one. I know there are those who don't know me anymore and those who I don't know because church, your church there has grown quite a lot. And by that, I won't know all those young people that are there. That's true. And That's I don't true. know if I will ever get back there. <laughs> you know, but yeah. I'm hoping that if time permits, <laughs> Maybe I can come back, or maybe you may come here and find me where I am. Okay. <laughs> we see Sister Adele often, and we see your sons often. They visit from time to time. Uh, so there is still that connection. Um, yes, Adele lives in New York still. Yes. And Nigel lives in Maryland. Okay. But I live here with Claire. I don't know if you know Claire. I know, I know Claire. I know Claire. You do? <laughs> is there anyone? Is there anyone in the Mile and a Quarter congregation whom you may want to say hi to? Anyone you want to 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 just give a quick greeting to? Sister Irving Bishop. Okay. Sister Irving Bishop. I'm sure she's listening. She may not be able to respond at this time, but I'm sure she's listening. Now we we want to wish you um, a happy Sabbath. We want to thank you for coming in. We are glad that you are, you are healthy. We want to encourage you to stay safe and um, keep trusting in God. May God that's bless what, you. That's my heart's desire. Okay. And I'm working with it. Okay. All right. Um, is there, Brother Sherwin, is he here? Um, no, he wasn't able to make it. Okay. Okay. To preach for us this morning is a dear brother, family member, friend, um, someone who is well known to all of us at Mile and a Quarter Church and in the district. He spoke to us earlier this year, just before the COVID-19 struck really hard and uh, we had to, to separate ourselves from church. Uh, he preached at Mile and a Quarter Church. Um, I think it was early in late or early March uh, when he preached at Mile and a Quarter. Okay. And the speech to us again today is Elder Charles Skeet. We are so happy to have you speaking to us today. We pray that as you talk to us, that the Holy Spirit will come close to you and will give you utterance. And so we want to ask God to continue to be with you, your ministry, and your family as you continue to serve him. And so we welcome Elder Charles Skeet, a dear brother, friend, and family. Welcome, Pastor Skeet. Thank you, Elder Limbrook. Uh, it seems like uh, the last time I was there, um, it afforded us the opportunity to share in person. Now we are sharing via uh, technology. Um, it's wonderful to be able to speak to you in this forum and to have the opportunity to see so many wonderful faces and have such loving memories. I, I, I could say based on the fact that I was the last person to preach before the shutdown that I, I literally shut down the church. So I'm, I'm hoping that this, uh, this sermon this time will certainly uh, reopen uh, the church of the living God at Mano Quarter. Now I know you can't, we can't touch each other, uh, but I'm going to believe that you're with me um, virtually and in your various spaces. And so I'm just going to ask those who have your video on, if you love Jesus, just put your thumbs up. 
you love Jesus. Jesus died for you. Uh, if if you if you are whether you have your microphone muted or whether you have your video on, if you are glad that Jesus is coming again, would you say Amen? Now I heard you. I know you're muted, but I heard you because that's what we live for. We're Seventh Day Adventists. It means we believe in the second coming of Jesus. Now it's a joy. It's a delight to uh, share God's word with you today. I'm, I'm really excited for this journey. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. And uh, I just want to read a passage of scripture that will focus us in our worship experience today. I'm reading from the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, as we consider this uh, topic today, what is church? Uh, John the Revelator writes, beginning at verse 1, unto the church of Ephesus, right? These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. And how doth can not bear them which are evil? And thou have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have whole found them liars. Verse 3 says, and have borne and have patience, and for my name's sake have labored and have not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou have left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first work, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But thou, but this thou hast, that thou hateth the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Shall we pray? Jehovah God, this is your moment. You've assembled the church and this is the day that you have made. We come together, God, because we expect you to show up. And so not only show up, but show out in our lives today. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, may they be acceptable in thy sight. For you are truly our strength and our redeemer. Amen and amen. It is interesting in this conversation John has uh, in a letter he sends uh, to, the, to the churches in, in which he says, Jesus reveals to the church that they have forgotten their first love. And I don't know about you, if you've fallen in love, I've, I've had that opportunity happen uh, in my life. And, and, and there's always something fascinating, something riveting, something gripping that happens when uh, you hear the words, I love you. I, I, couldn't, I could remember the, the first time I, I, I met my, my wife, we would talk for hours and hours on end uh, on the telephone uh, because when, when you're a pastor, it's not so easy to just roll up at a, a, a sister house or, or go out because you know, everybody talks, everybody talks. That's just what it, what it is. So we spoke a lot on the telephone. And I remember after we got married, uh, and, and, you know, after a long day with a church board or, or dealing with a crisis in the church or doing ministry, I would come home. And, and I remember one time she said to me, how is it when we were dating, you would keep me up for hours in the two in the morning. Now, every time you come home, it's as if your words finish. And, and, and that, that sort of uh, just sort of woke me up to say, ah, uh, skitty boy, you gotta, you gotta do better. You gotta uh, do something different. But this, this is the context in which this letter is formed. So there are three historical things we want to put into context uh, before I leave three points with you and send you on your way. Uh, the first is this, that according to patristic scholars and, and those who wrote what we call the anti-Nicene uh, or church fathers, the early writers, uh, those who wrote about the uh, Ephesus and about the early church, uh, names like uh, Polycarp and uh, Clement of Alexandria, or Justin Martyr, or Irenaeus, these uh, early church leaders, uh, the first thing we want to grasp is that Christianity was not a monolithic or, or sort of just a homogenous group, as if there was just sort of one group of people that had the expressed truth. Because, you know, sometimes it's 
easy to think that. In fact, one biblical scholar, uh, Barf Ehrman, he suggests that arguably the most significant breakthrough in the modern understanding of early Christianity is the realization that contrary to what had been early thought, this religion was exceptionally diverse. That is to say that when Jesus left the earth, uh, there were scattering of, of, of believers and, and some had slightly different uh, views. The second historical point I want us to put into context as we continue to paint the canvas upon which we will hang our conversation today is this, uh, that there were no cathedrals. Church wasn't like, you know, the cathedral we have over in Hopeland where everybody goes and, and gathers there, but rather church was house church. In fact, in his book, uh, Conflict and Identity, uh, the social setting of Paul's letter, Philip Esser argues and articulates on page, uh, page 131 there about that people worshiped in churches, these Christ followers, they were not yet called Christians, they were not yet a, a, a established religion, they were different to Judaism that met in the synagogues, but these early Christ followers in the Greco-Roman world, they worship in houses. We're gonna come back to that towards the end of the message, but he, he cites the various churches, like the church of uh, Aquila and Presca in Romans 16 and verse five. And, and he also cites the church of Narcissus, which is in Romans 16 and verse 11. The, the third historical thing I wanna sort of wrap your brains around is this, that contrary to what was early believed that the seven letters sort of were like letters. I want you to expand your understanding of this concept a little bit. There are letters, but they're not separate from the rest of the book of Revelation. So the document that John sent to the churches was the entire book, which was read in each city, which says that it not only has a historical context, as we've presented it over the years, where we believe that the church of Ephesus represents the first hundred years of the church, but that rather these messages were, were special to the congregations that received them, but also special to the individual members within the congregation. I wanna clear the air right now. The church is the people. I I'm gonna say that again, because I'm glad you asked. The church is the people. You know. I've chaired several church boards and, and, and I've heard this statement so often, you know, what would people think of the church if we allow X and Y? Hey, back up a minute. We are the church. When we talk about protecting the church, we're talking about ourselves. So even though the doors in Hopeland are closed, the mile and quarter church still exists. Will somebody say amen? I am so glad that when you nail up a church door, you don't stop the church of the living God. I'm so excited that when the virus comes around or persecution, just as was in the day of John, the church is still alive and well. And in fact, I believe it is difficult moments like this that provides us an opportunity for the church to grow, to really uh, be the church. And so let's get into three points I wanna share with us today that will send us away. And, and I've categorized it in a way that you could remember because communication is not so much what I say, but what you hear, what you understand, and more importantly, how God uses that to change your life. And, and I'm feeling right at home because I've discovered that home is where the heart is. And so I wanna shout out to my Spike Stone brethren. I spent three years of my church membership there, had a wonderful time. And, and uh, it, it's good to be in Manukwara and across the district, Black Best, wherever. Listen, wherever God is and God people are, I'm at home. Whether that's congregations in Canada, U.S., uh, if I don't say Dominica, wherever, because where God is, I want to be. Ultimately, he will come again, and, and that's why I'm making preparation to be there. So three things I'm going to share with you. I'm going to speak up, shut up, and send you on your way. The first point I want to share today is this. As I think about the church, and as, as John writes this letter to his uh, congregation scattered across Asia Minor, what we call modern-day uh, Turkey, there, there are three areas I wanna focus on to help us understand this message a little bit better. There are several categories of Adventists and an Adventist is someone looking forward 
to Jesus coming. So whether you're just a Christian, you, you're an Adventist because you are looking forward to Jesus coming. The, the brethren at Ephesus were Adventists. And I would want to believe they were Seventh-day Adventists, keeping the Sabbath day holy and looking for the soon glorious return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So there are all kinds of category of people who try to understand what it means to be the church. I'm going to just deal with three categories today for our edification. The first category I want to speak to today is the category I call the Gladventists. These are the balanced, happy Christians. These, these are, are those who have a smile on their face, uh, uh, keep a song in their heart, and go on God's errands that they would have learned early in the path in the club. These are those who recognize that in the midst of the COVID pandemic, our task is not to spread fear, but rather to have a sweet, abiding confidence in Jesus that no matter what ear may be the tie, God will take care of us. These are the glad ventures. These are the folk who have learned that church is a continuous celebration. Just as the four and 20 elders in heaven sang, holy, holy, holy is he who sits on the throne and is worthy of dominion and honor and praise and glory. This is the God I've come to know, not the other category that I'm coming to. There is a peace that comes that says, Jesus died for me. My sins are forgiven. He's empowered me with the Holy Spirit so I can live a consecrated life to him. In fact, John, in this conversation, he writes another epistle. We call it 1 John. And so in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, here's what he says in another place to these same group of people. He says, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our sins. Would somebody say hallelujah? I love the reality that what I did yesterday, what I did last night, what I did this morning no longer matter. It's gone, washed away by the blood of Jesus. Today, I got my name written down. I'm looking forward to going home with Jesus. I don't live in an oppressed place where I am, I'm, I'm, tied to what my past is. I'm looking forward to what my future should be. Somebody say, man, can I talk to the young people out there? You're going to make mistakes. You're going to get broken. But in the midst of your mistakes, in the midst of your brokenness, know that Jesus is still the rock. We can look to him. Unlike what they taught me when I was smaller, that there are places where Jesus can't go. That's not what my Bible says. One writer says, if I go down to the depths of the sea, he is there. If I ascend to a mountain, he is there. There's no place. There's no dance hall. There's no uh, strip club. Uh, there's no bar. God is present because God came as our scripture reading says, entered flesh and came among us and dwelt among us in the fullness of time. God is passionate about you. God is excited about you. God died to redeem you. And that's the message of the glad ventures that yes, there's doctrine. Yes, there's right behavior. But above that, there is a God who says in the midst of my journey, I can lean on him. I can call on him. I am comfortable in him because he is the one who was, who is, and is to come. He's the Alpha and the Omega. If I'm in him, I'm all right. The second group of people, however, that do exist. And before I go there, Sister White shows how this balance happened. She says in Acts of, of the Apostles, page 587, and it's all right, we can still quote Ellen White, right? Some of the best writings I've ever come across. And this preacher is not afraid uh, to call her name. Uh, it, it's all right. The, the remnant church has a prophet. She says it this way. At this time, when John was given this revelation, uh, many had lost their first love of gospel truth. But in his mercy, God did not leave the church to continue in a backslidden state. In a message of infinite tenderness, he reveals his love for them and his desire that they should make sure work of their eternity. Remember, he pleaded, 
from whence thou hast fallen and repent and do the first work. The church was defective and in need of stern reproof and chastisement. And John was inspired to record messages of warning and reproof entreating to those who losing sight of the fundamental principles of the gospel should imperil their hope of salvation. But always she says, the words of rebuke that God finds it necessary to send are spoken, listen to this everybody, in tender love and with the promise of peace to every penitent sinner. Hallelujah, somebody. Behold, I stand at a door and knock, the Lord declares. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20, end of court page uh, 587 of Acts of the Apostles. The second category of people, so, so the first category of people who was the church is, is the glad vintage. There's a, there's a balance between the vertical connection with God and the horizontal connection with man. But there's another category of, of, of church folk. I call those the sad vintage. Now, now I must declare to you that, that, that for much of my life, I was a sad vintage. You, you see, the challenge with, with sad vintage is that uh, th th there are there are hardliners in the church. Uh, I call them spiritual terrorists. Uh, uh, they, they're usually brought up in, in, in rigorously strict religious homes where, where uh, be, behavior conformity uh, and following the rules is, is done in the absence of love and or relationship. Uh, it, it, it flows out of a of an existence where we, we get all the behavior right as in the right doctrine, but then our interactions, to tell the truth, to use the younger people's term, our interactions suck. In fact, that's the challenge with the church. Why millennials are not standing church? They say, look, preach, I hear what you're saying, but, but when, we, when we look at what we see, we have a problem. Yes, we believe Jesus died for us. Yes, we believe there's a remnant church. Yes, we believe in, in the state of death. Yes, we believe 2300 year prophecy. Yes, we believe in events get of judgment. Yes, we believe Jesus is coming again. Yes, we believe in tithing and giving back to God what he's given to us. But, but preacher, preacher, I have a challenge because what we believe and what we see, there, there, there's a dichotomy. There, there's a gap between how we treat each other and how we're supposed to be here. The sad ventus. Uh, these are, are high on vertical connection with God, but have no human interaction. Here's how John the Revelator identified this group. He says in verse four of chapter two of the book of Revelation, here's what he says. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. In, in other words, you, you forgot where you started. You forgot that you were saved by the grace of God. And if people could see the transcript of your life, the things that you and I have hidden out of sight that nobody else or maybe one other person knows about, that those things that we have hidden in the sight, if people saw, we might be embarrassed. But because we could see what other people are doing, we want to expose them and, and we want to separate them from the church. But, but John says, Jesus says through John, Let's forget our first love. Let us remember where we started. Uh, Reinko Stefanovic, uh, one of our leading uh, theologians on the book of Revelation, commenting on this passage, here's what he says. He says that the church of Ephesus became legalistic and loveless. In dealing with heresy and discipline, those who were not doctrinally sound, they evidently tended to be severe, uh, censorious, critical, false finding, they had forgotten the, that only the gospel can balance religious duty with love and affection for fellow Christians. Wow, page 113 of his uh, monograph. Let me stop and pause for a little bit. So we have glad Venice who connect with God and connect with their fellow men. Then we have sad Venice who only want to connect with God, uh, they're, they're, they're of so much heavenly interest, they have no earthly good. Th that's not the church God wants. And then there is the third category. I call them the mad Venice. You see, in, in, in the church, there are those who are lawless. 
they, they take a posture like Revelation 2 and verse 6, but this thou hast and thou hearest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hear. These Nicolaitans, uh, you will see, they, they, they are compared to the church of Pergamos of having a doctrine of Balaam, but th this is a group that, that, that could be identified as those who wanted to do whatever and, and be whatever and, and still say that they, they are the church. Can I, can I put my hand up and, and suggest that being a child of God comes at a cost? It comes at a cost of giving up our personal choices, dying to self, and allowing Jesus to run our lives. Would somebody say amen? It comes at a cost. We can't do what we want, how we want, however long we want, and expect to be in the kingdom. Ah, this is a group of four. Mad Ventists are characterized by indifference. Uh, to live in a holy life, a, a submissive life. Uh, they do what, what pleases them. But I got news for you. Uh, John, again, in his first epistle to the same group of people outside of the Revelation, he says this in verse 6 of chapter 1 of 1 John. Here's what he says. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. That's a very diplomatic way to say you're a liar, you're pretentious, you're false, you're, 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 you're walking around, but you're walking in darkness. Jesus is light. And when we step into the light, the light shines in our darkness and the grace of God changes us. Now, I don't know why I would want to walk outside of Christ. Christianity is the most amazing philosophy I've ever come about. Where else do you know a philosophy? Where someone who is in a perfect kingdom called heaven, who created beings for his glory and his name to dwell with them in a garden when they were tempted with the one temptation that we have every single day, that we are not enough. That's what he said to Adam and Eve, you are not enough. If you want to be better, eat the fruit. And from that time till now, the human race suffers still with its question. You are not enough. That's why marriages struggle. That's why parents and children struggle. That's why we struggle in the workplace because when we feel like we're not enough, we get super sensitive and everybody we see talking is talking about us and everybody we see moving is moving because of us and everybody we see acting is because, can I tell you, get over yourself, grow up, it's not about you, it's about the world. We need to come to a place where we understand that the devil is a liar. He said to Eve, you're not enough. If you pick the fruit, you're going to know more. Listen, we know enough, and he who knows the wisdom of God knows enough to know that Jesus died. I can surrender, accept him as my Lord and Savior. Which other religion tells you this? Who the Son set free is free indeed. Yeah, we could go for years of counseling with a counselor, but the presence of Jesus can break every chain, every addiction, fix every situation. If we're willing, if we're willing to submit ourselves, change our financial circumstances, change our parenting skills, change the way we dress, change the way we talk, change the way we eat, change the way we exercise, because the power of God has the capacity to change us if any man be in Christ, come on, can I say, if any woman be in Christ, can I say, hey, if any youth be in Christ, he's a new creature, all things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. When we would humble ourselves to the power and working of Jesus Christ. And so my call this morning is very simple. We could be glad then this, we could be balanced. Every day being joyful, knowing that I don't keep a list of what I did and didn't do because Jesus says when he forgives my sins, he throws them in the depth of the sea. I don't need to remember them anymore. So I look to him from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. You know, Jesus, when he sent the disciples out, they came back saying, oh, well, it was powerful in, in Luke chapter 10. He says, you know, even the devils were subject Onto us, we were doing good, we were casting out demons, we were, we were feeling it. We we're doing, he says, Yeah, 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 yeah. But if you're gonna rejoice, rejoice that your name, <laughs> hello, somebody, rejoice that your name 
is written down in glory. Praise the Lord. When your name is written down, you don't have to try to perform harder to impress God because all our, our righteousness is as filthy rags. What we do is we receive the grace of God and because we receive the grace of God, we are committed to serving him with all that we have because now we're not doing it out of fear. We're not doing it out of compulsion. We're not doing it out of obligation. We're doing it because we're excited about who Jesus is and the fact that he died for us and that he's coming again. So we're glad, Ventures. Hallelujah. We can share our faith. It's a good news. The three angels' message, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him. Why? Because when we're in Christ, God judges Jesus so we get to go free. Somebody say amen. That's the good news that we tell to the world. That's the good news that we tell to our friends. And so I want to encourage you to be a glad Ventures. I want you to avoid the pitfall of being a sad Venice, where we have all doctrine and no relationship, no compassion, no patience, no endurance, no long suffering, no mercy. And for goodness sake, get off the bandwagon of being a mad Venice, where church is just a name and you just show up. As I bring this presentation to a close, the churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, and Rome were house churches. As you think about the message I just shared, ask yourself the question, what is our rush to get back to the cathedral at Hopeland? It's a beautiful place, love it. Work hard, help cutting cane. I mean, I wasn't as fast as my, my, my departed brother, um, Merton, but I, I cut a few holes. But we, we, we're excited to rush back to the cathedral. But before you get there, ask yourself the question, am I the church? Well, what about we come into a place where in our houses, we are the elders and the deacons and the deaconesses. We are the personal ministry leader in our church, in our location, so that my church where I am, whether the, 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 the church at Hopeland is open or not, whether, whether it's running or not, God knows that he could find me because his name is lifted up right in my location. People know that the church is alive and well, not because of the sign around the bend there over there in Hopeland, but because I'm present, because you're present because you're the church, I'm the church, and praise God, we are the church for whom Jesus died. Not the building, not the emphasis, not all the structure we've created. Can I just tell you, Jesus never built the church, hallelujah. He was a Roman preacher looking for people to just accept him and, and, and follow him and be connected to him and, and the structure would take care of itself. But praise God, we have an organized movement to take this message to all the world. That's why we have church buildings to assemble, to get the message. But when we give the message, it shouldn't stay in the, the building. In other words, you don't get up and leave the message in the seat. No, 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 no. You take it from the cathedral at Hopeland and, and you take it into your house church located in the zone. Uh-huh. Or manners. Yes. Uh-huh. Or, 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 or Black Bess or, or, or Round the Town or, 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 or Batali's. Uh-huh. I still know the place. Yes. I, I may be a form, but I still know the place because we are the church. This morning, God wants you to be a glad voice, excited about the gospel, Focus on what Jesus has done. Sharing this message to people who still suffer, who, who live in a, the turmoil of the COVID. But we have the answer. COVID doesn't have the last word. Jesus does. The, the economic shutdown and, and, and thank Elder Colin for sending up his workers so we can get produce from Leamington, Ontario to feed the rest of us. Hallelujah. But, 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 but. That's not the last word. The governments don't have the last word. Jesus Christ, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, one day will come with a trump, with a voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet him in the air. Then we will ever be with the Lord. But until then, we are the church on earth. And tell somebody that Jesus is coming. So hey, listen, if you want to be a part of being a glad man, just bow your head right where you are right now. As we pray, eternal God, this message today is very simple. The same, the first message you give to the first church in Revelation, and that is, don't depart from the first love. Understand that we're saved by your grace 
to live and to walk in the light. We both follow the doctrines and we have relationship with you and with each other. And I pray God that as we avoid the extremes of being a sad Venice, just eager for the doctrine of the church, but no relation, or a mad Venice who is just masquerading around, but no relationship with you. God, it doesn't matter if we were pushing drugs last night. God, it doesn't matter if we were with prostitutes last night. God, it doesn't matter if our marriages fell apart, if we were unfaithful. It doesn't matter right now. God, what's important is in this moment, God, you are redeeming your children. You are writing our names afresh in the land's book of life. Give us the joy to know that what we did is gone. What we're about to do is amazing. Thank you, God, for the vision that says you will finish this work in a blaze of glory. Grant us the privilege, God, to be a part of that work so that when you come, not only would we be saved, but those that we live with and that we minister for. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' mighty name, let the church say amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Skeet, for that word from God. We've truly been blessed. We recognize that we are the church. Wherever we are, we are the church. Thank you very much for allowing God to speak through you to us today. At this time, we're going to have a very special item of music by Brother Richard Goddard Ross.
Some of you may remember the story of Elijah. And it is called the story of Elijah and no rain. Now, after Elijah told the king that there would be no rain, some of us may remember that he was directed by God to go to a place where there was a brook flowing. It was called Shereth. And there God provided for Elijah. A raven brought his food and he was able to drink water from the brook. But the brook dried up after a while. Even as God is providing, the source of his provision seemed to have been drying up. After the brook dried up, God asked Elijah to go to a place called Zarephath. And God said to Elijah, I have commanded, I've spoken to a widow woman over there, and she is going to look after you. Now, Elijah goes to Zarephath, as God has commanded, and in Zarephath, he sees the widow woman. And she is collecting some sticks, and he says to her, I want you to provide some food for me. Give me some bread to eat. He'd ask her, what are you doing? And she said, you know, I'm collecting some sticks. I have a little meal and a little oil, and I'm going to bake a cake. And then my son and I, we're going to eat it, and then we're going to die, because this is the last that we have. Elijah said, make me a cake first. And the woman decided, through the prompting of the Holy Spirit, that she would make a cake for Elijah first. Brothers and sisters and friends, this is real faith. This is what faith looks like. This is what it means to be a faithful and true steward. The widow woman had only enough to bake, not a big cake for she and her son, but a little cake. But she decided to put God first. Are you putting God first even when you are down to your last, your last hundred dollars, your last fifty dollars, your last twenty dollars, your last ten dollars, your last five dollars? Are you still faithful enough to commit to putting God first? If you are going to be a faithful and wise steward, then God has to be first in your life, in everything that you do. I encourage you to put aside your tithes, put aside your offerings, speak to your church treasurer, find out how you can transfer your funds to the work of God. Because God wants to bless us, but he wants to bless us in response to our faith. God has said to us, if we are faithful, he will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Let us make a decision, a commitment to put God first and allow him to work on our behalf. Be a faithful and wise steward. Bring this service to a close. We do so by the singing of hymn 422, Marching to Zion.
beautiful, beautiful sun. Yeah, we are marching up there to heavenly sun. That beautiful city of God. Then let us Yes, go ahead, Elder James. Oh, Father who art in heaven, we thank you so much for today. We thank you, Lord, for the message and the messenger. We ask your continued guidance for the life of our past. We thank you so much, Lord, for the way in which you have kept us. We thank you for the way in which you have protected our family, our children. And it's so good to hear from our friends abroad. But Reverend and all others, they're assuring. We thank you so much for keeping them alive and safe. We ask that you will bless their family and their children and keep them safe till we meet around the great white June. We thank you for the district, Spice Stone, Mother of Water, God bless. And for all those who participate today, Lord, we ask your divine blessing. Strengthen our desire, Lord, to love the more. And keep us ready to meet you at any time you should come. Bless our leaders, direct our path, Lord, and shield us from the hands of the old devil. Continue to be with us from day to day. And as this virus remains there, help, O oh Lord, that your Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. Grant that our lives, Lord, may be an example that will lead someone closer to Jesus. Bless the service today and bless everyone that partake. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength. And we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. Amen. 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 We all need to give God the thanks and praise for what he has allowed us to achieve today. When we think of the glories that God has promised for all of us, we need not to let these transient things clog our memories. That's why we want to thank God again and we want to be back tomorrow night 
at 6.30 in the p.m. We have a fantastic and wonderful experience just in store for all of us. We want to bear in mind that Pastor Dale Haynes will bring the spoken word tomorrow. We have special music. I believe those who will be attending will be blessed, richly blessed, because God has promised to bless people when they join in worship. Tomorrow, we want to extend and want to open up this opportunity for all of our members. We want to challenge our members. We want to ask our members to invite the, their friends tomorrow. We want to have over, over 200 people, even if we have both Facebook and YouTube or any other media. We just want to be able to give our friends an opportunity to hear God's word again. So tomorrow at 6.30 in the p.m., we open up the opportunity. So church members, please invite your friends. Give the past a word to your friends because during the course of the service, we're going to have a special prayer for all of our friends. Our church members who have done the invitation, you then need to get your friends come. We need to acknowledge them as part of the service. And I'm sure that when they're all finished, that they can say thank you for the invitation. So the challenge is yours. The challenge is mine. What I'll speak to someone today and during the course of the more so that they can be on the, the Zoom link. Please give me the number for the more. Our technician will make it available to you. Give your friends a number. And I'm sure tomorrow we want to have as many people as possible. And our dear pastor, Pastor Peters, will be in attendance. You have a special prayer for all those, those children, those adults. I believe tomorrow is going to be the most wonderful night that we ever had in our Zoom services. So please don't miss it. Please don't forget, your opportunity will be God's blessing for all of us tomorrow night. So glad to have you again today. May God richly bless everyone and above everything. May the name of God be glorified and may we be blessed. I thank you again for being with us in the name of Jesus. Thank you again, church, and have a blessed Sabbath.